Germany has had an incredibly turbulent history, especially in the last 100 years, one full of rises and falls of all kinds throughout its more than 100, more like 2,000 years of history. So, in two days early celebration of Tag der Deutschen Einheit, he gibt es die Geschichte von Deutschland. It all started thousands of years ago, when humans first set foot on German soil, and especially once the Neanderthals, named after Neander Valley in Western Germany, I later left. They actually died, but for thousands of years, people all across Europe lived in many different tribal cultures, which will later explain why Germany has so many names nowadays. Hello, ich heiße Deutschland. Buenos dias, Alemania. Hello, Germany. Brozhovinia, Nimza. Dere, Saksama. Hey, Dusland. Grün, Dach, Dutzland. Was? Nein. Wie seid ihr so falsch über dieses? Aber die Niederländer haben recht. I guess it's Dutch, no? Dutch? Sprichst du da bei mir? What? No, I was talking about the Netherlands. Was? Mar ich bin nicht Deutsch. Ja, und ich bin Deutschland. Dumm Kopf. Äh, uh, espera. Como podemos comprender el uno de otro? This is because each group of Ausländer would encounter a different tribe or group from the rest, or would come up with their own word. When the Romans arrived after a conquest of Gaul, they named the territory east of the Rhine and north of Danube, Germania. These names came from tribes such as the Alemanni, Nemetz, Saxons, etc. No one knows where Germania comes from. Deutsch came from a word meaning of the people, but Britain couldn't tell the difference between the Netherlands and Northern Germany, which is how Netherlanders are actually called Dutch in English. Soon after, the Romans, as they often do, decided to invade, but only held on to territory until the Battle of the Teutoburg Forest in 9 AD, pushing the Roman border back to the Rhine, where it would remain for the next few centuries. In the 5th century, invaders from the east, known as the Huns, started to invade the area, causing the now larger Germanic tribes to seek refuge in the Roman Empire, and even took over some small bits of the Yelling Empire in the Great Migration Period, where the Visigoths ended up in Spain, and the Vandals smashed some stuff and ended up in North Africa. Rome's last Western Emperor, Romulus Augustus, was deposed in 476 by Odoacer, effectively starting the Middle Ages. Over the next few centuries, a tribe called the Franks started to conquer their way through modern-day France and Germany, becoming a namesake behind France. In 800, the Pope decided to declare that Charlemagne, King of the Franks, was now the first Roman Emperor in over 300 years, even though Rome was still well and alive in Constantinople. This would later contribute to the Great Schism in 1054. The two sides did not like each other. Nevertheless, Charlemagne's empire eventually led to the Holy Roman Empire, which was more of a loose confederation of a crap ton of cities and small kingdoms. The Hanseatic League, a northern European commercial confederation, also became a thing that Hamburg and Bremen would love to remind you about, and also became the namesake behind the largest airline in Germany and possibly Europe if you included subsidiaries known as Lufthansa. In 1517, amid recent corruption in the church and possibly influenced by China, Martin Luther gave 95 reasons he thought the church had changed. However, some people didn't take too kindly to that, which started the Protestant Reformation, and is how there are now three types of Christianity, one for the north, south, and east. The new ideas could be spread by the new invention, the printing press, invented partially to help with the labor shortage from the Black Death, which was brought to Europe by the new Silk Road Trade Road, reopened by the huge Mongol Empire, which started because of how badly the Mongols were treated by China. Remember? After a while, two German-speaking kingdoms came to dominate politics and affairs in Germany, Brandenburg Prussia, or Preußen, in the north, and Austria, or Österreich, in the south. Or it's the east. The Holy Roman Empire was effectively destroyed by Napoleon, and the German Empire was established in its place, leading to a growing sense of nationalism, and a realization of how late they were to colonization, and so they only got a shot at a few small areas. In 1914, a Serb shot the heir to the Austrian throne while in Bosnia, which led to threats that Austria-Hungary would invade Serbia in retaliation, who was a friend of Russia, which meant Russia would invade Austria-Hungary, who was friends with Germany, who would invade Russia, but would first have to invade Russia's ally France by going through Britain's ally Belgium. It really was this complicated, and this started World War I so-called because it was really European Continental War, it's just that Europe still kind of owned the world at the time. And eventually, Germany became a huge player in the Central Powers. So you probably guess who's to blame, right? That's right, Germany. After the war, the Allies demanded that Germany dismantle its military and pay so much in war reparations that the Deutsche Mark's value spiraled out of control, and it became impossible to pay for anything sensibly. All this led to a pretty rough time in the new Weimar Republic, which no one really liked that much. The bad economic situation, made even worse with the Great Depression, made some French ideas more and more appealing. When a well-spoken politician and former soldier joined the Nationalsozialistische Partei in the 1920s, he quickly rose to the ranks, through help of scapegoating communists, the Allies, and most notably, Jews. In the 1932 election, the party didn't quite win the election. However, noting their leader's popularity, 
President Paul von Hindenburg, who had just won re-election, appointed Chancellor or Kanzler Adolf Hitler. Hitler greatly expanded the role of Chancellor, and his supporters formed paramilitary groups to suppress uprisings. Propagating fears of a communist uprising, Hitler argued that only he could restore law and order, and bring Germany back to its former greatness. A young staffer set the Reichstagsgebäude on fire, and Hitler used the events to convince the government to give him more emergency powers, and quickly used it to end freedom of the press, disband other parties, and pass anti-Semitic policies. When President von Hindenburg died in office in 1934, Hitler's power was truly cemented. Nazi Germany allied itself with fascist Italy and Imperial Japan, and started its rapid march throughout Europe, conquering France, Poland, Norway, and invading the USSR leaving horrific and racist policies in her wake. However, a series of busts and failures, combined with fresh help from America in 1941, meant that once D-Day happened, Nazi Germany was effectively dead in water. The Allies stormed her way into Berlin, destroying many cities in Germany and her wake, and Adolf Hitler committed suicide in his underground bunker with Eva Braun, before they could be captured. After the war, Germany lost much of its land to its neighbors, and Germany, Austria, and Berlin were split up between the French, British, Americans, and Soviets. Austria fully reunited, as well as the non-Soviet parts of Germany and Berlin. The Federal Republic of Germany was established in the West, with its capital in the city of Bonn. The USSR, however, took advantage of this now severely weakened Germany, and kept the eastern half as a satellite state, with West Berlin being a Western enclave in East Germany. The Federal Republic of Germany prospered, and became one of the founding members of the European Union, while East Germany, or the Deutsche Demokratische Republik, largely stagnated, which prompted some East Berliners to defect to West Berlin, where they could then just move somewhere else. Embarrassed and infuriated by this, the Soviets built a huge, scarily secure wall in 1961, surrounding West Berlin, and East Berliners were not allowed in. However, no one who actually lived in Berlin liked the idea of this, like at all, and there were frequent calls in the 80s for democracy and to tear down the wall. No one thought these would ever happen, but then, in 1989, it happened. The DDR government allowed people to enter the West, and pretty soon, people started climbing over the wall and some even got whatever tools they had and started to hack away at the wall. At first, the guards tried to resist, but they eventually let their guard down and let the inevitable happen. One of the world's most secure and controversial barricades started to fall, finally bringing the two sides back together. Once the wall was down and the USSR was on its last legs, uniting Germany was, in a way, easier done than said, because the two sides didn't want to be split up in the first place. It was really just a punishment for World War II and a way to reorganize Germany's government. Finally, on the 3rd of October 1990, the former DDR became part of the Federal Republic of Germany, which finally moved its capital back to Berlin. And in the next 27 years, Germany became a rapid success story. Germany is now the most populous country in the EU, and alongside its new best friend, France, essentially leads the EU. And is the third biggest manufacturer in the world, directly competing with the US and China. So basically, Germany figured out how to be a great country. Don't be a f***ing Nazi. Thanks for watching this video on the history of Germany. Und wenn Sie mögen es, geben Sie ein Gefühl mit Agenbett. Und bis Sonntag mit mehr zu lernen. Tschüss.